So, um, as we've heard this morning, and hopefully as you'll see <coughs> when you go through the exhibition yourself, um, that there's kind of four main categories. Uh, there are the, the silks, the costumes and customs, uh, the ocean of porcelain, the thousand years of Buddhism, and the magic of jade. And um, these are all chronicled as well in the wonderful catalog entitled Two Americans in Paris. And I'm going to give a real shameless plug for the catalog because it, it's a wonderful, wonderful catalog. Um, it's got great photography of all the um, works of art that are in the exhibition, and it's beautifully written and edited um, by Jean Paul and Filippo and John. Um, and in addition to those essays, which are in a kind of a narrative form and are very informative, but also very readable, I must say, um, there are these wonderful stories. I mean, really wonderful stories um, that Sam tells about the collection and how it was formed. And I want Sam to tell us some of those stories today because I think that's what the exhibition is really all about, it'd be stories. And um, as he says, stories for my children and grandchildren. Um, and they're really personal stories and I think we've already heard today that everybody that's come up on stage has had a personal connection to Sam and Myrna. Um, and I think that that's what makes this collection kind of unique as well. And so um, if you take the audio tour, uh, you'll hear some of the stories, but they're not really, they're not relayed in the labels. So again, buy the catalog. <laughs> um, but I wanna go back to the beginning and Jean-Paul touched a little bit about it in his talk. Um, about the beginning of the collection and the thing that really strikes me about um, the journey that you and Myrna took over the course of 50 years and uh, culminating in 5,000 objects is the role of chance. And the role of chance and occurs over and over again um, in this journey and passion for Asia and these categories of objects that um, over time were developed. And so can you go back and tell us the story of um, Escona, Switzerland? Sure. The, um, I, I guess the, 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 the real basis for this unusual journey begins with the fact that we're just second generation Americans. Uh, our parents were both immigrants. We were the first people to go to college in our families, in each of our families. We didn't grow up with antiques or art. And so for us, it was absolutely a discovery that it was possible to have something beautiful that was actually a part of history. In terms of the idea of chance, that's, that's very much true. Because in fact, uh, when we first moved to Paris, I wanted to take Myrna on, uh, on a short vacation. And I had remembered that there was a hotel called La Romantica, and I thought, <laughs> That's where I'm going to take it. <laughs> it's a long story. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I mixed up the name of the town. And I was supposed to go to Lugano, and instead I went to Locarno, <laughs> which was 50 kilometers away. And when we got there late at night, I couldn't find the hotel, because of course it wasn't in the town. <laughs> And, 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 and so we found something that was fairly awful. The next morning we looked around and we said, ooh, this is <laughs> not really interesting. So we said to a, um, a person in the street, are there any antique shops so where we can look at some stuff? And they said, well, seven kilometers away, there's a little town called Ascona. And so we drove there and on the main square, there was this wonderful 17th century building with uh, uh, 
one of these huge doorways, and in the courtyard, there were cases and cases of antiques, uh, Greek and Roman and Persian and Renaissance and everything you could imagine. And everything had a little ticket and a number, but there were no prices. <laughs> so I said to Myrna, I think this is an antique shop. It had a sign, Casa Sarodina. Uh, and she said, no, it's not. It's a, it's a museum. I said, I'm going to go in and ask. And she said, don't you dare. I'll be so embarrassed. Mm. So I went in and asked. And it turned out it was, a, it was an antique shop. They had four floors, and the very nice young German woman said, go look through the whole thing. We came down. It must have been an hour, an hour and a half. And our heads were spinning to see all these incredible things that were clearly not things that you would ordinarily find. She introduced us to the owner, Dr. Rosenbaum, who was um, uh, very short, very old, sitting behind a desk, mostly bald, with uh, glasses on the middle of his nose. And she said, this is Mr. and Mrs. Myers. And uh, we went and shook his hand, and he said, goodbye. Mm. <laughs> we later found out that meant hello. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we said that we were just amazed to see all these things, but I was a young lawyer, and clearly we couldn't afford anything. And he said, how much can you spend? <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I, so I said, I don't know, $20? And instead of saying really goodbye to us, he, <laughs> said, he called to his assistant, Fritz, and he said, bring me the case of Tanagra heads. Tanagra heads being little Greek uh, heads about that big, uh, which were of deities or, or uh, uh, figures from, from Greek mythology. And he said, anything you want, $20. And so we started to look because suddenly we could have a piece of history. And we ended up choosing four little heads, which were the beginning of this adventure. I think that's just, I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good story. But um, next year, what, what happens in, uh, in Ascona? Uh, <laughs> well, the next year, we were there with our daughter. And we went, of course, to see Dr. Rosenbaum again. And we saw in his office on the mantelpiece behind his desk this Egyptian head, which was just thrilling, just captivating. But obviously, it was not in our range. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we went through the whole building, and we came down after a while. And we said, Dr. Rosenbaum, we saw some things, because we usually would show him what we found, and he'd discuss them and tell us, this is not interesting for you, or this is OK. And uh, I said, but clearly we can't, we can't buy anything. Like that was, at our stage, it was expensive, and it was simply expensive. It was an important piece. and. Um, he said, well, think about it over the weekend. I'll think about it, too, and then we'll talk. So we came back on Monday, and we had only been thinking about this one piece, which we couldn't get it out of our heads. We came back, we told them that, and he said, I have been thinking, too. He said, you have a daughter who's two years old. And to have something beautiful in the house creates an atmosphere. And that atmosphere will affect your daughter. So 
Therefore, if there's any way you sh can buy it, you should buy it. I said, yeah, but Dr. Rosenbaum, I can't buy it. He said, how much can you pay <laughs> if you pay every month? <laughs> well, I said, it's not plus. And I said, Dr. Rosenbaum, I don't know. He said, how much? I said, $50? He said, okay. But every month until it's paid for and you take the piece with you. And that was our first really important piece. Another really good story. Yeah. So both of those things are on view in the <laughs> exhibition, so you need to go see them. Um, when you go through the exhibition, you'll see that there's, um, there's a initial little section of antiquities, um, because that was the beginning for you and Myrna, um, because at the time that was kind of what people collected. That's sort of what you were looking at in galleries and being exposed to. Um, but then another kind of role of chance um, <laughs> stepped in and, and also kind of a leap of faith. And that's the other thing about your collecting story is kind of taking a leap of faith and acquiring things when you didn't know anything about them and then taking them home and finding out everything that you could about them. And, again, building up that collection, but um, you know, you eventually kind of focused on Asia, and I guess the next story is how that came to be, and it's the story of porcelain. So will you tell us that story, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, the way we got involved with, with Chinese art was, again, really purely a result of chance. We had gone to, Bru to Gaulle in Belgium for the weekend. And we got to an inn just outside of the town, but we were too early for dinner. And so we went into town to see what it looked like and what was there. But we were also too late for any of the stores because it was just after most stores had uh, closed and <clears throat> too early for dinner. So we started to look around, and the only shop that was open was a shop that sold Chinese porcelain. And so I said to Myrna, well, let's go in and we'll look at it. She said, I don't want to go in. She said, I don't like that black furniture with the big ball and claw feet. <laughs> but it started to rain. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. We didn't have there a choice. We walked in, yes. and there was a, a, a middle-aged man, a smallish man, who had a big smile and a fistful of mimeographed papers, who was very enthusiastic and eager to show us what he had. Mimeographed papers explained Chinese porcelain and, and periods. And Little by little, we looked at these cups and saucers and vases and dishes, and actually, they were rather nice. And we ended up being there, we almost missed dinner, for about an hour and a half or so. And we said to him, well, if we, if we were to collect Chinese porcelain, what would you suggest? And he said, oh. Kangxi blue and white, which meant the 17th to the 18th century. And so we started to choose some cups and saucers and a couple of vases and one big plate with the wall of China on it. And we ended up actually finding that these things are really rather interesting and quite pretty and so on. And we ended up with a whole box full of stuff. Um, and the next morning we went back and bought a few more. And we took them back to Paris and found that at the time there was an identification service uh, at the Musée Guimet. We took them in. 
And Daisy Leon Goldschmidt, who had written the book on Chinese porcelain, and who was uh, one of the, one of the uh, chief curators at that time, uh, explained that these things, which looked exactly alike, well, one was 17th century, as it was supposed to be, and another was actually 19th century. And that really piqued our imagination because we thought, why? why? They look exactly like they have the same color, the same design, uh, the same form. And so we read her book, and we started really to study, to try to understand how can you tell the difference between two things that look alike, and one is real, and one is a copy? Mm -hmm. And it took us about two years before we broke the code. And during that period, every weekend, we would go out to look for more examples at the uh, following days, we'd go to the museum to try to find out what we had. We had. It's another good story. Uh, yeah, you have also a very fine story in Belgium with a lion. Miana <laughs> Disco, <laughs> uh, you know, in, the, in Bristol. In the, well, in, in, in that. It's is a cover of the uh, catalog. It's on the cover, of, on the the cover of the yeah. catalog yeah. and in the exhibition yeah. in, the, in the Buddhist section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, uh, Myrna would very often go with me if I went on a short business trip. And on this occasion, I went to Brussels for a meeting. And while I was at my meeting, Myrna went to the antique area uh, in, in Brussels, the uh, Place Sablon. And she would look at the antique shops, and I met her after, after my meeting. And uh, on that occasion, I met her, and she was really very excited. And she said, Sam, I found something wonderful under a chair in an old antique shop. So naturally, I joined her. We went to the shop down the, uh, at the end of the square. And it was a, a, a shop with furniture and paintings and little sculpture and all kinds of stuff. And ex uh, uh, effectively, under the chair, there was this white marble lion. And she said, I think it's just wonderful. Now, it was something I hadn't seen before, uh, that type of object. And it was supposed to be 8th century tongue. Uh, and so I kind of, instead of being all excited, I was examining it and looking at it and questioning how do I know and is it or is it not. Well, she'd already decided to buy it, so we, we, we took it, I'd say under my arm, but it was, I guess, but it's pretty heavy. But we took it, we went back to the car, and Myrna was crestfallen. I said, but you have to understand. I'm trying to understand what it is. I, I, you know, I have to look at it critically. She said, yeah, but I bought it for you for your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't the best ride back to Paris. <laughs> it was a long ride back to Paris. <laughs> But in fact, in fact, Myrna had made a wonderful find because it is a magnificent carving. And when you look at it, if you see the power of the animal and the force of the claws that dig into the marble, you'll understand why she was right. Right. I know that you've said that um, you know, a good piece of sculpture has to look good from every single angle. I mean, 360 around. And when you go and you see this lion in the gallery, I mean, you can look at it from 
any angle and it's yeah, he, he's same for, for, for the Bodhisattva, it's the same for the Bodhisattva. You can see everywhere. Uh, I, well, th yeah. that's the... the and uh, for, for the Bodhisattva, uh, you are also a story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, there are a lot yeah, of yeah, stories, yeah. but... But with the lion, I think it's interesting, too, and Jean-Paul touched on this in his talk and talking about Myrna and, you know, how her intuition, you know, often was really yes, yes, just yes. spot on. Um, you know, she didn't always know everything about a particular object, but... Yeah. She could, she could see the quality, and then if she didn't know anything about it, she would go out and she would learn. But she, she take risk, she don't know uh, often well, at the I, beginning, but she, she take. Yeah. There were a, a, a couple of, of principles that we followed. One was, if one of us liked something and the other did not, we would not buy it. The other, which was equally important, probably more important, was that we didn't buy anything unless it had enough power to really captivate us or excite us. If it, it, it had to be, it wasn't a question of just being old and being 3,000 years old or 200 years old. It's a question, first of all, is it really beautiful? And second of all, does it have the power to really capture your imagination? Is it so mysterious that you want to know something about it, you want to understand it? Uh, is it, does it reflect sometimes the ferocity that it's trying to do, and if it's a sculpture, absolutely, mm -hmm. does it succeed from every angle? And that's true of any really good sculpture. The Venus de Milo is the same thing, or any sculpture by Michelangelo. I mean, we don't have any of that. But, uh, but, but those principles are essential. Right. I think it's interesting too that, um, you know, amazingly you do have, you know, within, again, these 5,000 works of art, these four sections, and certainly with the jade, um, one of the most comprehensive, if not the most comprehensive collection of early Chinese jade from Neolithic mm -hmm. to Yuan Dynasty. Um, you know, the porcelains, I mean, the history of Ming porcelain is there mm, in the gallery. Um, but that you weren't ever looking to necessarily do that. I mean, you, you know, you bought the things that you responded to in a very kind of visual and emotional way, um, things that you wanted to live with that were in your home, and we saw pictures of their beautiful home and surrounded by these objects. Um, you know, you weren't looking to necessarily fill in gaps. I mean, you know, you really had a passion for the art that you were collecting, and I think that's a really special um, characteristic about both you and Myrna, and then as a result, this, this beautiful collection that we're so fortunate to have on display here at the Kimball. Um, Jean-Paul, I want to ask you a question, if mm -hmm. I can. Um, actually, I have two questions. So the first is, um, you know, obviously you've known Sam and Myrna for many, many years, began as a teacher, yeah. then a mentor, and obviously a friend. And I mean, how did you come up with the idea to do an exhibition? And At the idea, idea exhibition uh, is uh, three, four years ago. Uh, five. five. No, five. no, no, more, more, more. More, more, more. The first idea, well, what Myrna and I and you had lunch. Yeah. Shortly after you retired. Yeah, yeah. And of course, when you retired, you said, I can't really do anything. I have 10 projects, but one day I will come and look at the <laughs> things. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, the difficulty is uh, you have uh, 5,000 pieces, you imagine. Uh, uh, on the three level, uh, everywhere. Uh, 
And uh, what is the way to organize an ex exhibition mm -hmm. is my problem at the beginning. Because uh, we, we see uh, African mask, uh, Korean tortoise, uh, 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 Mediterranean antiques. Uh, is the first problem for me. What is the way in there? Uh, and, uh, and we, we, we speak to, uh, together and uh, we find a way. And uh, for me, uh, the interest, because I have, my tradition is to make exhibition with museum, not exactly with collector, and the approach is quite different. This is important that the personality of the collector was in the middle of ex ex exhibition. Huh? And uh, is the reason why, because we have organized at the beginning a little about antique, and in the middle a little about uh, exotic culture, because uh, this is important for me to, to say exactly that you have a collector, mm. not only speciality. For, for me, it's easy to speak, uh, for instance, uh, for ceramic and, and so on. But I try to uh, open uh, everything and to, to give a, a, an image of, uh, of your approach of, of the work of art. Uh, uh, uh. And uh, we organize uh, three cabinets. Mm -hmm. uh, one for the antique, one for the medieval and mixed uh, discover, and one for Mirna. Be because at the end, uh, Mirna, uh, uh, which is uh, like integration of the past, because uh, she uh, have a necklace. Uh, for me, it's uh, is so, uh, so creative. They use the tradition, the past, the history to integrate in, inside. Uh, uh, this is uh, very, uh, for me, it's very extraordinary. Huh? And uh, the memory of uh, Mirna for me is uh, very important. Well, you just segued for me the second question. <laughs> um, at the end of the exhibition, uh, you'll see there's a, there's a case that has jewelry in it. And you might wonder, well, why is there, and it's contemporary jewelry, mm -hmm. but it's jewelry that's made with ancient jades and other stones. And when I was um, laying out the exhibition, um, planning the exhibition here at the Kimball, I didn't think that I had room for that case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was going to cut it out completely and just show one, one necklace. And Jean-Paul was extremely adamant <laughs> that I include this case of jewelry. And I said, okay, I'll figure out some way to get it in there. <laughs> and if you look at the photo up on the screen, you'll see that Myrna's wearing this see. beautiful necklace with this um, oh, carved oh, yeah. amber. Amber uh, from Liao Dynasty. From the Liao Liao Dynasty. Liao Dynasty. Yeah. And um, in from this case are York. these um, other necklaces that she took pieces from the collection, ancient pieces, and then she had um, particularly two contemporary <coughs> jewelry designers, um, mm -hmm. Annabelle Duarte and um, jo Joel uh, jo Rosenthal, Rosenthal mm -hmm. to make these necklaces for her. And it's because, and Jean-Paul explained this to me, why it was so important to have this case, and I, I get it. Um, these jades were worn in life. I mean, they were made to be worn. They, mm -hmm. they reflected the character of the person that wore them. Um, Confucius likened the purity of jade to the moral purity of the Confucian gentleman. Um, when you wore jade um, and these pendants, and you'll see this wonderful um, complex pendant that Jean-Paul kind of um, cobbled together from a bunch of jades, but it's not unlike what mm -hmm. they would wear in the Eastern Zhou period. All these jade pendants and hanging down, and as you walked into the room, they would move and hit one another and make this tinkling sound. And so you literally, you know, you heard somebody when they were coming in the room, and you mm -hmm. knew that was somebody important. And Myrna wanted to bring these jades back to life. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wanted to resurrect these jades mm -hmm. by making them into contemporary jewelry mm -hmm. and, and wearing them. And I, 
after Jean-Paul explained that to me and then displaying them and really learning, you know, as I was doing the exhibition and as I was laying things out, I mean, I was like, I, I get it now. Mm -hmm. And this is the way to kind of end the exhibition because it mm -hmm. sort of wraps up the story um, in a really nice, package and this this story of a journey of discovery and a passion for Asia, the role of chance, um, a little bit of good luck sometimes <laughs> and, and a lot of a lot of study um, and some intuition and wanting to live with beautiful things and one of the necklaces um, in the display case uh, has a little Han Dynasty cicada. And Han Dynasty is second century BC to second century AD. And, but I want you to tell the story of the shoebox. <laughs> well, we had been collecting Chinese porcelain. Virtually, it took over all of our interest for many years. And in 1974, each time I would go on a trip, I would go to the shops wherever I was, and I'd come back with a little part of a suitcase filled with what I, what I had found, and I'd lay it out on the table to show Myrna if she wasn't with me, uh, to see if she liked what I found, etc. And on this particular occasion in, in 1974, she said, oh, Sam, I'm getting tired of Chinese porcelain. Why don't you look for something else? I said, well, what do you want? <laughs> she said, I don't know. See if you can find some sculpture or maybe some jade. So on my next trip, I, I was in Philadelphia, and I took the afternoon to look at the shops in the center city. There was a little shop. They didn't have a window. It just had a sign, and it was halfway uh, uh, below ground, and uh, but we, we we knew the shop, and so we looked around. He had things from all over. He had Persian things. He had uh, Chinese. He had Korean. He had Indian, and so on. And so I I asked him, his name was Mr. Fiorillo, and I said, well, by the way, do you have any jade? And uh, he said, yeah, he was a cranky old man. He'd been there 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, I have some jade, but I don't put it out. People steal it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I said, well, can you show it to me? And so he brought out a shoebox that had 60 jade carvings in it. And he said, if you want it, you have to take the whole box. <laughs> <laughs> I was very reluctant because I hadn't really looked at Jade before. I said, I didn't know what all these things were. And I got him to agree that uh, if I took it, I would show it to Myrna. And if she liked it and we both liked it, I'd buy it. But otherwise, he'd give it back. Anyway. We, he sent it off. It was at a time, for some reason, he mailed it to me in Ascona, because we were there for the summer, or the, the month, not the whole summer. And uh, when we got it, we, 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 we looked through the whole thing. There were really interesting carvings, but we didn't know anything. So naturally, we went to Dr. Rosenbaum, and we showed him the, the jade in the box. And he didn't know anything about Jade either. Mm -hmm. So we went to Mr. Kohler, who had a, uh, another type of uh, antique uh, shop with mostly Tibetan and other Asian things. And he couldn't tell me anything either. So we said, well, we'll go to the jeweler, the, ju the jeweler in Escona, because he must know about Jade. Mm -hmm. and he didn't know anything either. Well, by then, we were really wondering, well, what the hell do we have here? <laughs> and so we decided to buy it and try to find out what we had. And eventually, it turned out that there were jades, mostly Chinese, 
a couple of, of uh, pre-Columbian. Mm -hmm. um, and they ranged from the Han Dynasty to the 19th century. And that was how we got involved in Chinese jade. So that little Han Dynasty cicada is, is, was in that box. Was in that box mm -hmm. and is a pendant that you can see in the exhibition. And Myrna and wore it. And Myrna, Myrna wore, wore it all the time. Yeah. Another really good story. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to quote from your closing thoughts that are also in the catalog because um, this really touches me and um, it's. I feel this way too. And I'm just going to read a few little um, sentences. Each object must stand on its own. I believe each object must have an inherent beauty and the power to move you. And the mere sight of wonderful work of art thrills me to this day. That's true. Sorry, uh, it makes me true. get kind of weepy. <laughs> But I, I want to thank you, Sam and Myrna, um, for sharing your collection with us. Um, and I hope that their collection will move you the same way that it moves Sam and Myrna and moves me. Jean-Paul, I want to thank you for bringing the exhibition together and bringing it to me and to the Kimball. Um, I want to thank Eric Lee and George Shackelford, our director and deputy director, for um, supporting me in, in bringing this wonderful exhibition here. Um, it's just been such a pleasure to work with you, to know you, Filippo and John. Um, I feel like we're all family now. So. I, I, I would like to add one word. Okay. And that is that I really want to thank you in particular and, and all of the people that work with you for a job that you've done which I think is really incredible. Because even though I actually do live with most of these objects and see them all the time, I've never seen them the way I see them in this museum now. And so I am thrilled. Well, then I did my job. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Also, so right. the museography is very clever. Uh, no, thank you. Clear and clever. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean-Paul. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today joining us on this journey. Please go see the exhibition again and again and again. It's on view for six months. Um, there's 450 works, so uh, warrants multiple visits, I hope. And tell all your friends to come. And thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.